Hello everyone, this is Avinash from Center of Artificial Intelligence from University of Technology, Sydney. And I'm going to present you some of the definition of brain computer interface, which you're going to see throughout this workshop. So before I'm going to dive into different definition, let's first talk about BCI itself, which you already heard from previous session. So in general, when we are interacting with the environment, what is involved with our cortex, our central nervous system, and from cortex to central nervous system, we communicate and perform action. But when you talk about BCI, our cortex can directly communicate and perform the action. It doesn't require any muscle in the middle. Like you can see here, muscle is missing. So that is what a BCI system is all about. One of the first BCI system has been proposed by Professor Vidal from University of California, Los Angeles. He showed that, that how BCI system architecture required, which can develop in BCI system. This work has been proposed in 1973, and he demonstrated this whole system, which can be seen in this picture. On your left side, he showed an experimental room where all the recording happened. But in the middle control area, all the devices which record the EEG and other information has been controlled, and then the computer area to communicate, store, and process those signals coming from experiment room to control area. So you can see this whole setup is quite big, where the brain-computer interface can be developed. But about after 15 years, um, but about after 15 years, in 1990, one of the first system has been demonstrated by Neil Burmauer. He demonstrated that the one user with implanted EEG is able to communicate, he able to type from his brain. And using his typing technique, he's able to write a letter to Burmauer saying that Professor Burmauer asking for a visit from him and his team. That was a very exciting time and it's about 1999 which is still very early time. So the question occurs, how we can measure the brain signal? There's a bunch of different kind of brain measuring techniques and there are a bunch of different brain signal measuring devices out there. And out of them, there are two major devices, uh, two category of devices are there. One is non-invasive, which required to open your brain and record. Some of the example of these is ECOG, like a UTA electrode or N1 sensor from Neuralink. On the other hand, there's a non-invasive device which does not require to open the scale, but you can only wear. For example, EEG, it basically measures your brain signal, electrical activity by measuring the electrical activity. Then there's a, some something called FNIR, so functional near infrared spectroscopy, which measure your brain hemodynamics uh, by, uh, with the change in the oxygen flow, oxygenation and deoxygen, uh, deoxygenation. Then there's an MEG, which basically measure very similar information as a EEG, but EEG measure electrical signal, it measure the magnetic field generated due to those electrical signals. And then there's an fMRI, which is very popular, common, can be seen in the hospital, which measure the oxygenation of the blood flow in neurons. So you can see there's a non-invasive and invasive technique, but then again, the question occurs in terms of BCI, if we should use the non-invasive or invasive, and the answer depends on the requirement and lots of other factors. For example, if you can see in this particular graph, 
um, has been published by DEFEX in 2018, that there's several different factors of devices, like a temporal resolution, a special resolution, and also the portability. But how we can choose the BCI device? I categorize this in the following question. So you should ask this question that if this question apply on the BCI system, then yes, those devices are good to use for vein measurement for the BCI. For example, temporal resolution. BCI need, system need to be a fast. So we need a system with high temporal resolution. So more system, more in this direction. Second is our special resolution. We also need to consider that it has a good enough special resolution to capture some important information. But of course, we can go more deeper like implanted EEG, which have higher resolution and higher temporal resolution. But in terms of portability, I believe the implanted EEG required invasiveness, which is not easy for lots of people. But if you see this CD, like a surface EEG and MEG, they are still acceptable, but I would prefer surface EEG, which is EEG in general. And of course the cost and non-invasiveness. So in terms of cost and non-invasiveness is also EEG wins. So it's clearly can be seen that EEG is, that's the reason why EEG is one of the most common device in BCI system. What are the type of BCI we can develop from these EEG devices. So I personally divide in three categories, active BCI, reactive BCI, and the passive BCI. Active BCI here is means you really perform some sort of thought and make a voluntary control to perform action. But on the other hand, passive BCI work on the backside quietly without telling you what is going on but simultaneously update the environment around you. And then we have reactive BCI, which lies something in middle. This nice graph can demonstrate how active and passive BCI work around here. So why we want to do BCI research? Like you, can, you have seen in the previous slide in uh, the research by Bell Bomber that he enabled a disabled person to communicate from his brain. That's actually the, one of the major motive behind the BCI design. And as per the statistics, there are a lot of people suffer from lots of disability. So that's where the BCI research has been started and define their goals. So what are the potential BCI applications we can have out of that? From 1999 to now, the definition of BCI has been changed a lot. It's not just limited to disabled people, but now lots of healthy people also using it for so, so many different purposes. So it's not just uh, become assistive system, it's also useful for neuroprosthetic, neuro training, and gaming and virtual reality kind of thing as well. So you can see BCI application has stretched their dimension in, in all directions. And there's a no such application which is not possible currently with BCI. I give you one demonstration of BCI for playing gaming. In this particular application, you can see that user can play a game using different BCI strategy. Of course, he's, so this flickering you're going to see here is a one kind of BCI happening, which is known as the SSVB and user can control the things using that SSVP to give the higher score for himself so that uh, he can win from the monster. But there are other things also we're going to happen. We're going to see in some seconds. Um, the user can increase this attention to have a higher power. So this is kind of example now happening with PCI system. So the new motivation or new definition of BCI research, what I defined earlier, became more like a 
we need a BCI system which can replace the existing interaction technique. For example, interaction in the virtual reality. We need a system which can restore your ability for interaction, like interaction for disabled person. And more importantly, enhance your existing capability. For example, cognitive gaming, which you can enhance you and learn a new BCI skill just playing game by brain. So, so this is in conclusion, I want to say that the BCI changed from 1999 to now a lot. More accessibility, more tools, more reduction in the cost enable lots of users, lots of people, lots of uh, researcher to develop system which is enable all kind of interaction around the environment. Doesn't matter as a disabled or healthy person. Thank you.